So, how about it, Jaco? I hope you all say now Mzuri Sana or Nico Fiti or whatever. Um, that's going to be the only Swahili words you hear from myself today. I welcome you all to my um, keynote here at Yuri's Night and I welcome you all again to Yuri's Night. I'm very happy you're all here and I can also be here at least virtually. Um, later on, I'm actually going to be there um, virtually, but for Q&A. And um, yeah, um, I'm happy we can do that event now. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the history of human spaceflight and careers in spaceflight. Um, but before I actually go into detail what's going to happen right now, um, a few words about myself for the people who didn't meet me yet or don't know me. Um, I'm Adrian. I'm German sitting here in quite sunny actually, but quite cold Germany right now. Um, I have a master's degree in physics. Um, I had some courses on space science and astronomy, but I'm basically a space enthusiast as you all are probably. Yeah. And um, together with my um, background and my interest for education, I started CASA um, together with several people of Tunapanda late 2018. And um, right now I'm still working on it with Mel, with Neville, who is also there, and Renise. Um, I'm very happy that all the people are involved. There are more. And, and that we can also do that event here, this Yuri's Night um, this year. There you see a picture of myself in 2019 at last Yuri's Night when I was in Kenya. Um, so happy to be here again. Um, as I said, that's going to be the topic of today. And um, that's a picture I'm going to show you later on again. Uh, maybe some of you know, um, but that actually fits quite well to the topic. I tell you more about later. Um, today I'm going to talk about six different topics, um, which are all related, uh, so subtopics, which are all related to this main topic. And um, it's meant to be some, um, yeah, some background for the for the later on group discussions. Um, so I give you more a basis. I'm not going to go super deep into any topic. It's more like to get you all started and to get you even more inspired in space science. So what's important about spaceflight, about human spaceflight and the history of it? Topic number one is the influence of spaceflight on life on Earth. So basically the question, how is spaceflight making life on Earth better? And um, I mean, here, that's the guy we are all here. Um, so why we're all here? It's Yuri Gagarin, um, 1961, sitting in his um, small capsule um, going up to space, or maybe already came back, I'm not sure. Um, but of course, there are other people also involved. Um, for example, here, Apollo mission, Apollo 11, first um, people on moon, um, 1969. So all humans um, in space or even like on other um, bodies in space. But I would say what is even more important for life on Earth actually of space science is things which even happened before and of course afterwards. And that's, for example, Sputnik. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have seen pictures like that before. Um, but why are satellites that important for our life on Earth? Um, it's pictures like these. Um, that's a picture of a satellite um, of the GPS system, so of a positioning system which actually enables us or enables us all on Earth to locate where we are um, on meters difference. Um, it allows us to find our way through the traffic, allows us to actually whatever find other locations, but also it allows ships to move um, autonomously, maybe in the future even cars together with other systems. So like tracking systems and location systems like GPS or Galileo of the Europeans are things which are super important. And we have space flight and um, the satellites we got up there, uh, which are already few thousands um, help us a lot. But of course there are other satellites up there. There are communication satellites or there are satellites like these here, I think it's a German one for Earth observation. So satellites which are actually able to scan the surface of the um, of the Earth to know where our resources are, or for example, how the climate and the weather is changing. And these satellites together with um, like backscattered radiation like infrared or so is for example, um, able to 
or enables farmers to get more knowledge about their farms. So um, how green is like the surface, which plants are growing, how is the overall ve weather situation changing. So satellites like these could help farmers actually in Kenya um, to like like increase the outcome of the farms, which is actually already used by the Kenyan Space Agency. So Earth observation in general, I would say, is a big thing how space flight is affecting life on Earth. Another thing is, I would say, after Earth observation would be sky observation. So what you see here is um, a network of telescopes. It's radio frequency uh, telescopes, which together, um, it's not um, what they what they actually detect. It's not light as we know it. It's another frequency, and they were able to took a picture which looks like that. And I find that personally, as a physicist, very inspiring. Maybe all you as well. I think it was 2018 or 2019. Um, it's the first picture of a black hole, and um, that's called Messier 87, or in the in the center of a galaxy, that black hole. So these telescopes together were able to give us more knowledge about how the um, how the space is looking around us, to get more knowledge about. Um, yeah, how the how the universe is actually looking and therefore gives us knowledge for life on Earth, for where we come from, where we are going to, how is like, yeah, the universe actually expanding, all that stuff is like is happening with um, with astronomy and with sky observation. And of course, I mean, there are pictures like this from the Hubble telescope, um, which retired recently, but there's a successor, the James Webb telescope, which unfolded um, I think in March, so very, very new telescope, which is enabling us to get even more pictures from deep space and stuff. And um, I know there's the um, astronomy um, organization at Tunapanda or at Yuri's Night right now. So there are people which have a lot of knowledge about astronomy. And I'd say it's just great what astronomy teaches us for life on Earth. And of course, based Besides this, just a few examples, there's way more. There's like technology boost due to space science. Um, like there are a lot of um, companies are growing due to um, when, when NASA is doing something or ESA is doing something, a lot of companies which are growing in that, in that field. And um, there's econo economic growth due to space science. So there's a lot of impact from space science on life on Earth. Yeah, with these few examples, um, I'm going to go to the second part um, of today's talk. It's about the later usage of spaceflight technology on Earth. So basically, how technology, which was developed for up in space, later actually beneficial on Earth. So not direct use of space science, it's, I would say, secondary effects, maybe. And this picture here more or less already shows everything I want to show. This great international space station, um, and for now, look on the sides, kind of the wings. Um, these solar cells here, the energy um, support of the international space station. These solar cells were developed already, like in early 20th century, but their first usage was on satellites. So when you look on here in the center, that's one of the first American. Um, satellites, the Vanguard one, um, and it's quite small as you see, and there is a tiny box, um, like it's a bit reflective, I'm not sure if you totally see it, it's um, center right, it's a solar cell which is actually or was powering that first or second American satellite, so solar cells were developed um, mainly or first used in, um, in space flight. And when you look on a satellite, maybe almost same size, the one Kunz um, PF, it's the first all Kenyan satellite um, developed, I think 2016, 17, 18, something like that, together with the University of Nairobi. And um, this CubeSat, um, I think has also solar cells here on the edges. And therefore solar cells, big thing in space science. But as you see here, a picture of like our CASA slides, it's energy of a source of the future solar cells. So renewable energy are a super important aspect um, of getting yeah, 
rid of climate change to reduce it actually to find things after carbon um, emitting um, energy sources so therefore solar cells super huge impact um, from space science on now life on earth another picture also from international space station here alexander gerst a german astronaut um, up there a few years ago um, he's there on a like a trimming bike um, to do sports and to actually get knowledge how um, astronauts up there in space are aging let's say it like that because like they are living in a microgravity system where like almost no gravity is happening which is actually affecting their cardiovascular their bone system and a lot of other like body systems are affected which means um, they are aging actually faster so what um, scientists do right now is like get to know how is that working for longer space missions. It's very important to know how they actually can reduce these faster aging effects. And that knowledge actually is already used on Earth to reduce, let's call it like that, aging on Earth and to actually help medicine up or down on Earth. So um, this is, has direct effects on our medicine here. So medicine, another one. And just to show you a few more pictures, um, that's from The Martian, a very nice movie um, I showed last time at Junta's Night. Um, that's um, how growing plants on Mars could work. So on a planet with scarce resources where you actually have to be very careful what you, what you do. And um, these scarce resources are also, for example, in areas like Turkana County or like other areas in Kenya or in Africa. So knowledge from how to do farming on Mars could um, already um, help people in, um, yeah, in areas like Tokana. So all that um, scientific um, ideas which are developed for space science has an impact here on Earth, um, for example, there. Um, that's like a project, Learning Lions, um, they grow plants in Tokana next to Tokana Lake or like Tokana. Cool. Um, from that um, few examples, I go over to the next topic because I'm already quite long here in time. It's about cooperation. It's about how cooperation between different nations and cultures um, are beneficial um, and are, are happening in spaceflight. So what do you think um, when you think about a program where people had to cooperate together? And maybe like a great team you would think about is that one look at like Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong and uh, Alan Shepard, I think um, it's called um, like the first people which two of them actually stepped on moon. And um, that was, of course, a great teamwork. And like they together um, did a lot of effort actually to, to fulfill that mission. But of course, behind these three guys which worked together, there was like a big team. So when you think about that big team, you maybe think about these in the operation room or something it's called. So in the middle, Werner von Braun, but there are other, um, other people, of course, working around. But actually, the whole team about the Apollo mission was, as Wikipedia says, 400,000 people. So there were 400,000 people, which is as much as like whole Kisumu city, third biggest city in, in Kenya. And um, so, so many engineers were scientists like people working in observatories like workers like so many different people in media and stuff worked on that mission to get people to moon so in america it was a great teamwork a great um yeah example of cooperation and how um, people can work together but it's not just with nations just look on the International Space Station, which I find is the greatest example of teamwork and cooperation worldwide. Um, like all the flags around, and there are five different um, space organizations involved. There's the NASA, there's the ESA, so the European Space Agency, which is actually um, from 22 different countries. There's the Japanese, um, there are the Canadians involved, and there are the Russians involved. So. The Russians and the Americans actually work closely together on a on a big project um, on a, like an, on an, um, on on a station up there in space, 400 kilometers above Earth. So it's just a perfect example. And 
although Vladimir Putin actually said due to the war he um, is doing in Ukraine that he wants to stop the cooperation in 2025, I think it's just a great sign when you look on that picture here where like just in March it was, um, Russian, here in yellow, Russian astronauts got up to International Space Station in suits which actually looked like the Ukra Ukrainian flag of yellow and blue. It, I don't know it, if it was on purpose, people are speculating about it, but it just shows how scientists and astronauts are willing to work together even in wartime and um, how cooperation worldwide can actually foster due to spaceflight. So yeah, with that, um, I want to go over to the next topic, which is about the role of private organizations in spaceflight. And what you see here is um, what I found, the first private satellite up in space. I think it was the 60s, so even then, like more than 50 years ago, people were actually on their own, not in a big organization, thinking about, okay, how can we get something up there, or at least how we, can we develop something which is flying around there, falling around there, um, which sends signals to Earth and does some maybe Earth observation. It's, it's just great. And of course, um, next to all that um, organizations like NASA, ESA and stuff, um, there are a lot of companies um, growing um, which are supporting space technology. So there's in Germany OHB Systems or um, Airbus, there's Lockheed Martin, there's Boeing in the States, and there are like so many different companies which are supporting organizations with their tools, with satellites, with a lot of, lot of things. So private organizations are, have always been a big player and are growing. Because just look about that picture um, of a guy which I find very, very fascinating. Not everyone likes him, so it's about Elon Musk. Um, I'm pretty sure Mel can tell you more about him and uh, what he did. Um, but the, uh, the, the, um, the corporation or the company SpaceX, which I think he founded or at least he has a big part of, um, which is the first private organization which actually has rockets which are landing afterwards. So that's not a start, it's actually a landing of rockets. Um, and in, that was, in 2008, it was the first rocket which going up there. And nowadays, the Dragon 2 is bringing um, astronauts to the International Space Station. And in, God, it was late March or early April, so a few weeks ago, there was the first fully private flight to the International Space Station. So coming from, I would say, more the supportive role and developing parts, there are nowadays organizations which are actually organizing human flights up to space, which is just incredible. And um, is it beneficial? Um, I would say pretty clear yes, because um, one part is it the dependency on the Russians here on the Soyuz capsula is increased drastic and uh, decreased drastically because like now the Americans, for example, have their own path um, to space. But second, there's a big market effect. And although market is not maybe solving every problem, um, due to different companies wanting to take part in the space race, um, the prices for getting things up there are lowering and lowering and lowering. So it's way easier today for smaller companies to send a satellite up there because just the costs for cargo ship up to space is just decreased drastically. So I'd say um, I'm not a big fan of touristic um, of just touristic um, operations to space. But in general, what a lot of people do um, when these companies here are just, they, yeah, they're pushing space science forward. And um, I'm not sure what you think about it, but that's just some ideas I had about it. And I wanna show you another picture, which I think is just great. Um, that's the Klitschko brothers. One of them is the mayor of Kiev um, in Ukraine. Um, they were both, um, super heavyweight champions in boxing, <laughs> crazy guys. Um, and what you see there in front of them is kind of an antenna of the Starlink system, also developed actually by Elon Musk and his um, SpaceX company. Um, and that Starlink is actually a network of more than 2000 satellites circulating um, Earth, which bringing internet to like, let's say scare areas and areas where no internet connection is that easy. Um, possible, for example, in a war in a country like Ukraine, where like the infrastructure is of course damaged, 
And um, what Elon Musk actually did was to allow his system to already operate and he sent some of these, let's call them antennas, um, to, to Ukraine. So people in there could actually have internet even in wartime, although actually their system is still working quite well. But this Starlink system is just another example how private organizations can actually support the development in spaceflight. And even in Africa, I'll just give you another example, private organizations or, and other organizations invested more than $3 billion um, dollars in the last 20 years. That's the number I got. So also in Africa, like there's a lot of um, yeah, economy growing around space flight. Okay, so far about that. I wanna go to the second last talk, uh, part of my talk today. And um, it's about the meaning of history of space flight for future missions. So the question, how can we build on what we learned for future missions and what are these missions about? And um, so all what I told you before, like different technology, different missions um, I showed you, but what are, what are actually the goals in the future? And I just picked two, there are so many, but I, I would say I picked two main things about human space flight, which are happening right now. And one is going to the moon. Maybe some of you would ask, okay, why to the moon? We have already been there, but there's actually a clear path why NASA and other organizations are doing so. Um, that's a picture. You don't have to read all of that. Um, I just took it actually um, from the Artemis program. The Artemis program is about sending the first person to moon in the 21st century. And what they want to do in the next, actually, just three years more, so in late 2024 or 2025, they actually want to send people already to the moon. Um, and there are different now. You have the origin capsula, which actually I think is um, transporting the people. Um, then there is like on the on the right side more. There's the gateway, which is called a system a bit similar to in the International Space Station. So they use knowledge from the International Space Station to have something which I think is circulating the moon. I'm not super sure, but that's what I read. Um, so they use that technology of the International Space Station. They use um, rockets which were developed for getting people to ISS right now. Um, they want to use the Starship, maybe the Starship of SpaceX. So a private organization is going to be involved. They're going to use knowledge they got from um, medicine experiments for how people could live that long um, up there. So a lot of a lot of knowledge they actually gained already. Um, they want to use to bring people in lunar um, orbit and then actually on moon. So that's actually this um, lunar gateway, this um, this this yeah space station which is circulating the moon. And that's how it could look like when that um, that object here on the left side is landing on moon and then the first astronaut in 21st century is setting a foot on moon. It's just, I mean, I, I just find it great. There are a lot of series about it right now. And um, that's a big step um, which is happening right now and where we're very soon. Um, but that actually that project is not just about moon. So when you look on that um, on that slide here again, on the upper right corner, you already see like an orange um, orange planet in the back, and that's of course the Mars. So the knowledge they're going to gain and the technology they're going to develop um, for the Artemis program is something they want to use for their long-term mission to going to Mars. And they're like, especially NASA and SpaceX talking about it, how to get there, and of course other organizations and countries as well. But I just wanted to talk about these two. So NASA actually says there are three steps to go into Mars, which could happen in the 2030s, they say. So there's the Earth reliant phase, which means that they are still reliant on Earth. Um, they get knowledge how people are living in space on the International Space Station, what are the medical effects, which technology is necessary, things like that. And also actually um, the trip to the moon is still in there. So that's the first phase. Second phase, they call it proving ground, which means um, sending, I think I can click to that one, yeah, sending um, 
something like a capsule to deep space. So that's the deep space transport, which they envision to use to go to like deep space, which means, for example, on a way to Mars. So developing that stuff. Um, Lunar Gateway is actually also already in that phase. And then a third phase would actually be to go to Mars, so an Earth independent phase, um, which means missions to Mars, um, setting a foot on Mars, which would be just awesome. And maybe it's just 10 to 15 years back uh, forward. So who knows? SpaceX actually has an even more um, earlier plan. So they say maybe late 2020s they could, um, they could work on that or Elon Musk proposed that. I'm not sure if that's um, if, if you can rely on that. But Starship um, heavy lunar system and all the technology developed for the moon mission right now is something they want to use for Mars mission. So you see here a clear path technology back then. It's about energy. So solar cells, it's about systems so rockets and space stations it's about um medicine how people are involved and how how is it working like on the human body when you go to space a lot of things are developed there for longer missions um, which are gonna happen and there's a big push right now from like a lot of people like how we could get more out from from earth and i just find it very awesome and um when you look on that, there are a lot of things actually happening also on Earth. Future buildings, that's for example, something we work on it with CASA. So how could you have like inhabitants um, living on Mars? Which kind of houses do you need? How do you need to develop these things? A lot of things or future food we also work on. So how can you grow food actually on Mars? Things like that. And um, we have right now at CASA um, um, a project where kids actually developed some things for Mars living. Mel can talk more about that. I find that a very nice project. So um, also something maybe for future discussions later on. Cool. Last part of today's talk. Um, I want to try to have it in less than 30 minutes here. Careers in spaceflight. So what, what are roles of future careers in spaceflight and how could Kenyans be involved? And that here, I actually just really, it's a glimpse of ideas I have. So please don't um, say that's all or that's missing. It's just, you should just have an idea what I just thought about um, when it comes to careers in spaceflight. And when you see the picture here of an astronaut standing in Kibera, which is, I find a very awesome picture by Marie Steinmann, um, I have to admit, not every one of you will go to space. Um, I mean, that's pretty clear, I would say, but there are way more things around spaceflight where people from all over the world, but also from uh, Kenya or Kibera can actually get involved in spaceflight. And um, just to give you some ideas, what I just showed you was satellites for Earth observation. Um, so for example, the Kenyan Space Agency is involved in projects how data from international satellites um, which are taking pictures and different infrared pictures and stuff like that from Kenya's surface could be used from farmers to actually increase their farming output. So there's already happening things like that. And you could maybe get involved in that or in future ideas, how that knowledge and the data, which is actually um, gathered there could be used um, on Earth. Second, a picture I showed you about the first Kenyan satellite. Um, that was 2018. Um, so of course there like there are more satellites getting up there due to the cost is reduced. And um, University of Nairobi, as I said, is involved, but there are other um, organizations maybe in future and involved in developing satellites in Africa and in Kenya. So why not thinking about which kind of satellite do we want to develop? How can we get involved? Is there a possibility? Things like that maybe. Um, third, sky observation. Maybe you're not going to take a picture like Hubble. Okay, that's a bit far off. But sky observation, so getting knowledge about our universe around and about like bodies which are circulating the sun and things like that are possible with telescopes using here on Earth. And later on in that um, Yuri's night here, you're going to be able to use telescopes. And I mean, there's here's the Amateur Astronomical Society of Kenya, so an organization which is working on that and other people here, I'm sure, 
having knowledge about telescopes. So sky observation is definitely a thing how you could get involved in space flight and space science in general and getting knowledge about the universe. Then energy sources of the future. So technology developed for space flight and use on Earth. And as I said, solar cells is just an example, which is which is um, like used widely. And um, when you ask Mel, we as CASA, we developed a course on um, energy sources of the future and especially solar cells. And we bought a solar cell, which is right now just two um, floors above you on the on the head of the building. So using, for example, solar cell for your community to get independent of um, of energy um, support um, from companies could be a solution. But of course, there are other things developed for space which could be beneficial for your life on Earth of, or of your community. And then um, buildings, gardening, things like that. Um, here, just the example of gardening, um, like the example between Mars and Tucana County, so rural areas um, where a project of us, our partner project, Learning Lions, for example, is involved. Um, things like that could work um, also for you. And then corporations, as I showed you that picture here, um, corporations, huge thing in general, in science, in technology, in um, economy. And there are so many organizations right now already involved in space flight and in space science and in um, astronomy and things like that. It's CASA, it's the Space Generation Advisory Council here, Leo Sky Africa, Mars Society of Africa, Amateur Astronomical Society of Kenya, just the organizations which are around you right now, but there are of course others. So maybe just find out what is around you, just get involved or build your own. Just think about how you could work together with people on space science and um, yeah, develop that further. And then maybe together with people, you could also work on private organizations. Um, maybe you're not going to develop SpaceX right now, but maybe you find other guys work together and develop a weather balloon or develop something else, a small satellite like the CubeSat or something else. So private space flight, a big thing. Companies are there. Maybe there are um, employment possibilities at existing companies or you find a way to grow and uh, to build your own. Things like that are possible. And the last, um, although I said it's maybe not obvious, well, it's maybe obvious that not everyone will, of you will fly to space. Um, but why is, should that person there in that animation, so the first um, American in the 21st century setting a foot on moon, why must it be just an American? So maybe in the mid future, long term future, they're going to be a person standing on moon with the Kenyan flag on the arm. Who knows? Let's dream big. And um, maybe that's a very long term goal or a mid term goal. And we'll see. Maybe the first Kenyan astronaut will be up there. And to conclude that talk, I show you just that picture here. Um, and who already knows it for the others? It's the Broglio Space Center in Malindi, Kenya. A picture, I think, from the 80s. I'm, I'm not sure it could be also earlier. Um, it's it was actually um, a spaceport where rockets went up to space for for satellites set up by the Italians. Um, it's not used right now. Um, there's just a satellite control system. I think what is used um, at the um, yeah, let's call it Mombasa coast. Um, and it's just an example why Kenya could be also a place where rockets could go up again. Um, you know, you're, you're right at the equator. It's a perfect um, position for, for satellite missions or other missions. So why not having um, something like that in the future again? Why shouldn't Kenya be in that space race involved more heavily? And um, therefore, I want to conclude that talk with just that, that picture. So think about um, what could be there in the future. How could Kenya be involved again or more? And um, with that, I want to thank you all um, for listening to my talk. And I'm here for a short Q&A. Um, and otherwise, have fun in the, um, in the later on group discussions. I thank you all and see you.